Hello everybody, welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs here in New South Wales. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Ian Lincoln, the President of the Institute, and it's a great honour this evening to be launching for the Institute's members and audiences Fact or Fission by Richard Bronofsky. Richard probably needs very little introduction to this audience. He started life as a barrister in Adelaide and joined the Australian Foreign Service with postings among, among other places to Burma, the Philippines and as ambassador to Vietnam, to South, to South Korea, to Mexico and neighbouring Central American countries. He worked in a senior position with Radio Australia and as an associate professor at the University of New South Wales. Sydney, Sydney where he operated a program that took young Australians into Asia for media experience. Um, Richard became an officer in the Order of Australia in 2019. And in addition to all of those achievements, he was my predecessor here as president of the Institute. And in Vietnam. And as ambassador in Vietnam, indeed. I forgot. Thank you, Richard. Fact or Fission was first published in 2003. It begins with an illuminating survey of the development of Australian nuclear policy from the 1950s and ends with an unforgiving chapter which analyzes the creation of the Australia, UK, US uh, security partnership and the implications for Australia's nuclear behavior as the prospect arises of nuclear powered submarines. There's a great deal in between and we very strongly recommend the book. If nothing else, do read the eloquent and thoughtful final concluding chapter, which brings together so many important themes for, for the future of Australian policy, indeed for the future of Australia. But that's enough from me. It's uh, part of my duties in launching the book to point out that you can buy copies. In fact, so many copies are sold already that uh, there's just one left right here in the hall. But we can offer you advice on how to get copies and uh, it's very fully recommended. So Richard will speak to us now for 30 minutes or so, following which we'll have half an hour for questions and discussion. If you're online, we ask you to put your question in through the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. So over to Richard. Ian, thank you for that generous introduction. We are close colleagues and friends over many years, and we have similar thoughts on many subjects, not everything, but quite a lot. How many of you are familiar with Mark Foy's building in Liverpool Street, which is now the family court? It advertises for corsetry and Manchester and all the things that women used to wear or buy back in the 30s. And it's surrounded by, it's got yellow uh, marks around, around the building. You, you would have noticed those. It's part of the decoration of the building. That is depleted uranium. That was put there when the limited amount of uranium that we found in Australia, and this is when the nuclear science was in its very infancy, was regarded as a cosmetic by women, and they paint their faces with this stuff. Anyway, it's there, it's probably still very radioactive, but we don't talk about that much, and as far as the stochastic illnesses of people are concerned, I'm not sure many or any have come from that site, but there it is. I want to talk firstly about uranium and its richness in Australia, and the struggle we've had with various uh, different points of view in Australia about whether we should export it at all, leave it in the ground, or export it under very strict safeguards. And that's what we've done. We have exported it, but it's been an embarrassment of riches. It started out in 1906 at Radium Hill in South Australia, where some uranium was found. Um, it, it extended to Hunter's Hill, well, Hunter's Hill became uh, a, a, a reprocessing plant for, uh, for irradiated uranium, and it's still radiotoxic. But 
wild dog and my ponga in South Australia, Rum Jungle in Northern Territory, Mary Kathleen in Queensland, Westmoreland in Queensland. The second wave occurred after the Second World War. The Ranger deposit in Northern Territory, one of the most rich, the richest deposits in the world. Incidentally, we have more uranium than just about any other country. I think Kazakhstan has a bit more. Nabalik Kangkungara in 1970 in the Northern Territory, Jabaluka in 1971, and Olympic Dam and Roxby Downs in South Australia, which was begun, mine was begun there in 1988 by Western Mining Corporation and then was taken over by BHP. The sophistry used to suggest that could be a mine for, you, for uranium was that it was really for gold and silver and copper, and uranium was a byproduct but it's still one of the most fertile sources of uranium in Australia. Labor had a three mine policy. Bob Hawke did that. Uh, Gough Whitlam really started that, but that was before it became properly regulated. So now we have five, dam uh, five, five mines operating in Australia. Olympic Dam, Ranger, Beverly, um, Four Mile Island and Honeymoon. These are all, and we, we export to about 42 countries. And the dilemma has been, should we export it without safeguards or not? And there was a huge battle in the 50s during the Cold War period and afterwards between the nuclear, pro-nuclear people who wanted to have nuclear weapons and export uranium without any in inhibitions or safeguards around it and they were led to some extent by the Australian Atomic Energy Commission. Now we have, a, we're honoured to have here tonight, Mark Ho from the, the success organisation to the AAEC, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. Welcome Mark, I'm glad you're here. I think Mark is a nuclear engineer, is that correct? So it's good to have some expertise and I, I wonder whether he's going to agree with anything I have to say, but still, I'm very glad you're here. Good for the debate. Uh, so the, there were two nuclear knights in Australia, Sir Philip Baxter and um, Sir Keith Baxter and uh, Ernest Titterton, thank you Alison. Titterton and Baxter were extremely pro-nuclear. They're the ones who promoted the British nuclear tests in Australia, held first at, uh, off the Western Australian coast a, a superannuated British frigate was brought to Australia, HMS Plym, and they put a bomb in it and they exploded it in the Montebello Islands because they wanted to replicate what would happen if a bomb was exploded in the Thames estuary, what would the damage be? It was followed by three detonations at Emu Field and then another 12 detonations of nuclear weapons in Maralinga. The trouble with all that was that some of those tests, there were some other tests as well, which were not nuclear detonations, but there were tests to see if a plutonium bomb or a uranium bomb on an aircraft and the aircraft crashed, whether it would detonate. So there was a lot of plutonium-239 spread around the desert at the end of the tests. And the British, I think, were quite dishonest, disingenuous in saying, oh, we'll clean it up and the Australians had to clean it up too. And it's still, there are areas where First Nation people cannot go in that area. At the time, Menzies was Prime Minister, and Bob Menzies was not particularly keen on Australia developing or having its own nuclear weapons. And uh, the Australian Atomic Energy Commission and Titterton and Baxter and a lot of other people said we should have it, we should have nuclear weapons. But Menzies said, no, it should be left in the hands of the superpowers of the United States, the Soviet Union, and Britain, of course. So they, uh, there was a war going on. There was a war between the Department of External Affairs, as it was then called, and the nuclear knights and the nuclear establishment. Uh, don't forget this was a time in the 50s and 60s China had developed its first, detonated its first nuclear weapon in 1964. The Brits had withdrawn from east of Suez in 1967. 
the Vietnam War was not going very well, and uh, uh, McNamara and Rusk, two American senior statesmen, came to Australia in the 19, late 1960s, and Australian politicians said to them, the Australian government, should we develop, can we, would you permit us, because it was a kind of a colonial situation, would you permit us to have nuclear weapons? And they did not deny it. They said, yes, well, you probably need them. So all this led to an impetus on the part of the pro-nuclear weapon lobby who wanted nuclear weapons. The opposition at the time uh, was developing its own particular feelings. Gough Whitlam was the first Australian Prime Minister, or the Prime Minister who ratified the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and wanted to attract International Atomic Energy Agency safeguards to all Australian uranium exports. John Gorton, of course, before Whitlam, had plans to develop a nuclear reactor at Jarvis Bay, ostensibly for electricity to put into the New South Wales grid, but in fact, to be able to extract the irradiated material, extract the plutonium-239 and make Australian weapons. It was Billy McMahon, his successor, not a very well regarded prime minister who actually put the kibosh on that and said to jo John Gorton, listen, you can't do this. He said, people will see through it. They'll appreciate that you're, you're really developing, you want to develop nuclear weapons and it won't, ha won't happen. And Reginald Sw Schwartz, his minister for national development and energy, did a survey of, Luca, of, uh, of the, the reactor at Jarvis Bay and said, yes, we, we cannot do it. And when he came to power in 72, Gough Whitlam put the kibosh on it and ratified the NPT. And from then on, for quite a long time, certainly throughout the Whitlam period, Australia was circumspect and careful and responsible about its Australian uranium exports, and even more so was Whitlam's successor, Malcolm Fraser. Fraser had a particularly strong animus towards the Soviet Union. In fact, and this is a, an ironic uh, event that we should remember, at one stage Fraser, in all seriousness, wanted to have a, uh, a comprehensive uh, barrier against the expansion of the Soviet Union. He wanted the United States, Japan, China and Australia in this, in this agreement. It didn't last long, but it just shows you how foreign policy can change over the years. Fraser was a Cold War warrior. Um, he, he wanted to export uranium, but uh, he wanted the very strongest of safeguards. Uh, he was, there was a, a, a feeling at the time that perhaps instead of selling our uranium to, to people who might divert it, countries who might divert it into weaponry, we lease uranium and not sell it. And there's a, a, an outfit called Pangea Metals who came to Australia, a blow-in, blow-out organisation, who put a very serious proposal to the government of the day saying, look, why don't you manufacture, turn, turn yellow cake and rich yellow cake into, uh, into uranium-235 in the correct proportion, about 3 or 4%, or maybe up to 20%, lease the rod and manufacture the rods, fabricate the rods, lease them and bring them back and bury them in Australia. It was an idea that was followed by, in semi-seriousness, by Bob Hawke when he became Prime Minister. He thought, he, with dollar signs flashing in his eyes, how would it be if we developed an international nuclear waste repository for all countries in the world? Thank God that didn't get off the ground. The fact is that we cannot, at this stage, even find a repository for low-level waste, although they're working on it in South Australia. Fraser, though, was very conscientious about this, and he wanted to have all kinds of uh, circumscriptions against, sending, uh, against selling our uranium. The U-38 uh, was to attract International Atomic en Energy Agency safeguards. Um, Old export contracts were to be, would, were, before the IAEA and the NPT existed, were to come under these controls too. 
we could not sell to countries that hadn't ratified, signed and ratified the NPT. We could not allow commercial companies to negotiate commercial agreements for the sale of uranium until a bilateral safeguards agreement had been negotiated between Australia government and the government of the country to which it was to be exported. These countries were not allowed, that we sent our uranium to, were not allowed to enrich or re-export our uranium without Australian approval. And that had to be done in each particular case. Gradually, these prerequisites became uh, adulterated by commercial considerations and within Canberra, because the then separate Department of Trade under Doug Anthony when Fraser was Prime Minister, wanted to take over control of nuclear regulations from foreign affairs. And Fraser objected to that and didn't allow it to happen. But there was a battle between the commercial interests in Canberra and the, those in foreign affairs particularly who had principles about not exporting this stuff. I have to say that there was a tremendous debate in the Labor Party about uranium and whether to export it or not. And I'll just quote to you uh, the debate of 1967 when, uh, if I can find it, 161, here we go. This is a, a, a spirited debate in the ALP caucus. It was, there's a, a, a Stuart West was arguing that an amendment to allow mining was an irresponsible document. He said to Bob Hawke, Bob, it is not even credible, mate. It endorses existing policy and then goes on to, ex to repudiate it. Delegates, do not kid yourselves. It is a pro-mining document. There are more reasons now to confirm with our policy against uranium than there were back in 1977. Here the proliferation problems have been have the proliferation problems been solved? No. Has the waste deposit problem been solved? No. Have the environmental problems here in Australia been solved? No. In 20,000 years, maybe the name of the Great Australian Labor Party will be forgotten, but this stuff will still be around. Don't you see? Don't you see the responsibility you have to mankind? The reason why we want a change is because we're running scared, running scared of the electorate. We're running scared of the mining companies and of the Fraser government and of all the pressures that can be brought. So it was pretty, pretty uh, serious stuff. One of the exacerbating factors during the Hawke times was that uh, people were very anti-uranium, anti they were very anti-nuclear power. Um, Palm Sunday marches were very strong and a lot of people were very much against uh, exporting this stuff. And one thing that was exacerbating this was the French nuclear testing in the Pacific. There had been 41 tests uh, under Whitlam and Whitlam sent in HMAS supply with a, a New Zealand frigate or Targo into the test area to go round and round in circles. It wasn't particularly effective but it was a way of expressing to the French his great protests at having nuclear testing in the Australian backyard in the Pacific. Later on, uh, uh, Evans took France to the International Court of Justice on the same issue. And the French were very much on the nose. It's very interesting when we see how we wring our hands at how the Morrison government has upset the French and how the French were very scandalised by what happened. But I tell you what, at the time of the French testing in the Pacific, uh, the front French were very much on the nose. And I'd like to read to you a rather scatological piece from the satirist Bob Ellis, who wrote in 1995 during the second wave of French tests. The French are a dense and arrogant people, idle, pretentious, and rabbit slaughtering. All the men are identical, as Gore Vidal so rightly noted. Pot-bellied, green skin, stubble, limp cigarette on long wet underlip, unlit but somehow dribbling ash in acres down the pendant clothing, large and serviceable penis, 
limp handshake, always a foot shorter than their improbably glamorous wives, torpid in conversation, unsanitary as guests, always holding a small white yapping poodle and sound and soused on rough red wine from the age of three. <laughs> Imagine how the French were right, quite angry with that. So the, the, the whole point of this early part of my book, which is still relevant today because it's history, is that there's been a, a tension in Australia. Australians are quite ambiguous about uranium, whether to sell it, who to sell it to, and we've got 42 customer countries now, whether to leave it in the ground, and whether, and now I come to weapons, whether we should perhaps go ahead with nuclear propelled submarines. I was asked to rewrite, not rewrite the book, but to republish this book with some chapters on nuclear submarines by a group of scientists and environmentalists who said, look, people have forgotten the struggles, the moral struggles we had in this country about uranium and whether to sell it or not, and whether we should have weapons or not. Yes. Let them remember this in the context of the AUKUS agreement of 2021. Now under AUKUS, many things are suggested and promised to Australia by the United States and Britain. Technical advances in weaponry, guided missiles, but above, and cyber, and cyber uh, activities and technologies, but above all of them, or what stands out, is to replace the French Barracuda attack class submarines, of which we'd ordered 12, with eight nuclear propelled American or British submarines, either the, uh, the British class, the astute class, or the Virginia class. Now, these are big boats. Virginia class submarines displace 12,000 tons fully submerged. The British, a bit less than that, but they basically have the same technology because the British bought highly secret uh, radio, uh, nuclear propulsion technology from Westinghouse in the United States. And Rolls-Royce took it on and then the British began to develop their own nuclear program. The fact is, and we, I'm sure there'd be some people who would refute this or dispute it, we don't have a sophisticated nuclear industry in this country. We can export U-308, yellow cake. We've no, made no serious attempt to refine and enrich it, to turn it into uranium hexafluoride, to put that through centrifuges to, and to enrich uh, the uranium in the isotope 235 to the necessary extent the least of which is about 3%, the most is about 20% for civil uh, electricity generation. It's not true that Australia has never had its Navy under foreign control. Right from the start, in, when we first developed our Navy in, two, in 1911, Alfred Deakin quite rightly or quite openly and quite relaxedly gave control of the Australian ships to the British Navy, where they remained in wartime conditions under British command until the Second World War. Another thing to remember too is that people talk about we have a great defence gap by not having submarines. Well, that may be true, but we didn't have any submarines in this country throughout the Second World War. We had two early submarines in the First World War, one of them uh, breached the, the uh, barriers in the Straits of Marmara and went into towards Turkey, and that was sunk. The other disappeared without trace while trying to track the German East Asia squadron when the war began in 1914. But we had none in the Second World War. Did that make us more vulnerable? Well, there's a good example for saying yes, because if we'd had some well-placed conventional submarines in the Torres Strait, at the time, four Japanese aircraft carriers that had attacked Pearl Harbor came and attacked Darwin on the 19th of February, 1942, maybe it would have given them pause. Maybe they wouldn't have come, or maybe they wouldn't have sent all four, because those four carriers launched a, a first wave attack of 188 aircraft against Darwin. As one of the pilots said later, contemptuously, 
It was a target not worth the weight we put against it. It was far too small. Equally, if we'd had submarines patrolling off Sydney Harbour in June of 1942, perhaps the midget submarines launched from six motherships out in the Pacific would not have got into Sydney Harbour, not that they did a great deal of damage. As you know, only one non-naval ship was sunk and that was Cutterbull, which had some wet ratings on board, 19 of which were killed. But Chicago, a heavy American cruiser, escaped and so did all the other ships. But if we'd had submarines then, it might have made a difference. So I don't think one can say submarines are not necessary. They are a particularly important part of area denial. But my argument against nuclear propelled submarines is that we don't need them. Furthermore, if we have American or British and probably going to be American technology, the Virginia class technology, we will be dependent on American systems and expertise, not just in building the damn things, because they're going to be built in Groton, Connecticut or in the, in the American uh, electric boat industry uh, headquarters. I don't think they can be built here. Look at the, all the problems we've had, the Collins class submarines. Uh, and they're going to be, there'll be a very strong influence by the Americans, not only to man them with, with, with uh, experts, but to, to command them as well. So Labor talks about the sovereign right we will have over the submarines once we get them. I suggest to you that it's a pipe dream. I don't think it's going to happen. The other point I'd make is that nuclear submarines are quite noisy, believe it or not. Some of them have jet propelled uh, propulsion water jets instead of propellers to stop capitation noise. But the pressurised water reactors have to have pumps to keep the water cool and that, that can be picked up. What would be better? And there's been one uh, parliamentarian, um, Alex Rorkin, I think his name is, Dawkins, who published a very good article recently. He was in submarines for about 12 years in Australia. He said, look, we should get area uh, denial... Rex Patterson. Uh, Rex Patterson, thank you. We should get area independent propulsion systems. That's what the Soryu-class submarine has in, in Japan. It's what most of the Europeans have too. Very sophisticated. They can stay underwater for a long time. They only come up for the indiscretion period of breathing once every 21 or 23 days or something like that. And they possibly don't have the range of a nuclear propelled submarine, but do we need it? Do we need to join, what, which we'll be very strongly urged to do, to join a, a force that is there to, 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 pen, to, to keep China at bay and to keep the, their own submarines penned in? I think it would mean uh, that China would immediately see Australia, it probably does already, as an adjunct to American forces threatening China. What we need is area denial around Australia. So I suggest to you that it's, it's a contentious issue and my bet is that it won't go ahead. I think we'll find these damn too expensive. And what Rex, Rex Dawson suggested is we could get four conventionally powered submarines with air independent propulsion to augment the diesel motors, four for one uh, nuclear propelled submarine. Just not worth it. I'll leave it there because it's just on seven o'clock and open up to any questions that people might have. Thank you. Thanks, Those of you here in the hall, please wait for the microphone. First question is from John Hallam. I knew it. <laughs> I, I guess this is predictable, and in, 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 in some ways this is an amazing trip down memory lane, um, because I remember organising 30,000 people outside the uh, door of um, the man who was then French consul, um, and the irony of that situation is that he is now a mate and we work 
together very closely on getting stuff up in the UN General Assembly. Um, I guess what I wanted to talk about was the submarines. Um, it is certainly the case that a son of Collins submarine um, would be able to slip through um, every sonar detection system that exists where a nuclear submarine could not and take out um, major capital ships such as aircraft carriers um, and that in my view is what Australia needs. Um, some people here would disagree with that assessment uh, it's a shame that Captain Skinner is not here. Um, we've had uh, one or two lively discussions about that, but do pray comment. Well, I have no pro no comment really to make, John. That's a you made a statement. Yes, I basically agree with it. I'm not sure about the science of uh, of son of Collins. Uh, Collins had enormous problems with the welding with the the noise with the cavitation, all sorts of problems all the way through with its, its uh, weapon system uh, and its, uh, its computers. And it, it's still not a particularly good boat. The Navy uh, boasts about getting through certain screens around aircraft carriers and war games with the United States and sinking carriers. But no, I, I think it's... Uh, and it's reaching the end of its life. You know, we don't have long to go. But I think there's too much confected panic about not having submarines at all. <laughs> what we do need is, is patrol boats and a, a bigger air force and, and missiles that can strike uh, incoming vessels. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing issue, an ongoing problem. But my bet is that we will not acquire Virginia class or astute class nuclear propelled submarine. Apart from anything else, where do we berth them? Where do we put them? Do we allow the Americans to have nuclear vessels come into Australian ports as well? These are all sovereign issues that we should very seriously look at, not just the single issue of whether we get nuclear propulsion. We have a question online from, I believe, Chris Skinner. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, Chris's question is, based on your presentation, there is a role for nuclear propulsion of submarines if they are required to provide Australia's primary deterrent to a potential aggressor. Do you agree? No. I've explained why. I think conventional submarines with, with their independent propulsion would be better. These are the submarines. The majority of European countries with submarine fleets use them. They do not have nuclear propelled submarines. What this does though, if we get them, it will encourage other countries who are on the threshold of this kind of technology to acquire nuclear propulsion. And I suggest to all of you that nuclear propulsion is only one step away from being nuclear armed. Uh, Virginia class is supposed to be an attack class submarine, that is it can kill other submarines in the water and surface ships, but it also has vertically launched missiles, tomahawks uh, and other subsonic air breathing ground attack uh, weaponry that could be nuclear tipped. So they're not just a, a submarine to defeat or contain a, a Chinese submarine fleet, they're also an attack submarine that could attack the China itself. Do we have a further question here in the room? And online? Oh, John Murray, um, why were the French selected in the first place? Because, <laughs> very hard to explain, I remember going to a um, reception at the Japanese Consul General's place here in Sydney and the uh, Japanese ambassador came down and the day before, Tony Abbott had been very impressed with the Japanese Soryu submarine. In fact, the Soryu was a name given to one of the six aircraft carriers that attacked Pearl Harbor. But it then became the, it then became the name for a class of Japanese, very sophisticated submarines. And I thought Tony Abbott was going to go for the Soryu submarine. And at the reception, the commander of the Soryu submarine that had been in uh, war games with the Australian Navy of Sydney 
stood up in his full military fig and he said, uh, this is our second time we have uh, visited Sydney Harbour and submarine. <laughs> and <laughs> it sort of went through to the keeper. I think everyone laughed. And I remember seeing the very poignant picture the next day in the Sydney Morning Herald of Soryu sailing through the heads with the Japanese rising sun uh, flag flying, the naval flag, and they were going back to Japan. And that's the day they announced, we announced, that we are going to take the French ship. Why the French submarine? Well, because I'll tell you why I think, and this is a speculation, they're, they're nuclear propelled. We asked disingenuously for conventional diesel-powered submarines of that class, that attack class, the Barracuda. But I think the long-term plan was to replace the conventional diesel engines with nuclear propulsion. Point is, though, that the French submarines don't have uranium cores enriched to 93 to 98% uranium-235, which keeps the submarine going indefinitely. And you just, when, when the reactor stops, the submarine stops, and you take the reactor core out of the submarine, you break it up and take the thing out. It's been welded into the hull. But uh, you, you would have to service and look after the submarine in the meantime, and we don't have the technical skills to do that. We develop them, no doubt. I don't want to, I don't want to criticise our capacity to do that, but we haven't so far. Next question. We have one online. Yep, uh, our next question from online says, thank you for your presentation. You argue uh, subs are not necessary to defend Australian lands. However, wouldn't subs be critical in playing a role, uh, uh, playing a role strategically further out into the Indo-Pacific? Well, yes, but do we need to have strategic submarines going right out into, what, why do we need to go right out into the Pacific? What that means, that's the subtext for saying, because we're going to attack or contain China with the United States as part of their force. I suggest to the, the uh, questioner, with respect, that Australia's role is as a sovereign responsibility of this country to have forces that can protect the mainland, can protect Australia, but aren't necessarily there to mix it with a, an overwhelmingly powerful country, which is also our greatest trading partner, out in the Pacific. We should not be doing that. And it seems to me that ineluctably we would be drawn into doing so. We already have close integration with many of our weapon systems and training with the United States, Air Force, Army and Navy. But we don't want to do this. And I do think that because of the lack of independent thinking on the part of the Foreign Affairs and Defence Establishment in Canberra towards the United States, there's, there's no doubt that the Americans, if we do take Virginia-class submarines, will put the pressure on us to make them, to integrate them, as we integrate some of our other weapon systems, into the United States Navy against China or whoever other enemy they decide at the time. Uh, yep, our next question, a uh, bit of a different tact. Uh, you emphasise the importance of having sovereignty over defence hardware and software. Is there a big difference in the level of sovereignty afforded to Australia by her joint venture partners in building such assets, whether these be nuclear powered or, non or more conventional? That is, would Australia have had more or less sovereignty over the end product of the submarine in the agreement with France compared to that signed with USA and UK? Well, that's a very interesting question with many facets to it. Parts of Australian defence platforms, tanks particularly, but also infantry weapons, uh, transport, like the Bushmasters, we have pretty well built ourselves, not so much tanks, but Bushmasters and armoured personnel carriers. Uh, and yeah, they're, they're, they're really, they're, they're our own, we have sovereignty over them. But there is a, a mindset in Canberra that wants to integrate our systems with the United States. Our training in all three armed services, a lot of it is conducted in the United States, particularly the Air Force with the F-35 aircraft. 
And it always has been the case when we had uh, sabre jets. We built them in Australia, but we still had enormous training programs for our pilots in the United States. We've had ships integrated into the United States Pacific Fleet. We've had a ship based at Yokosuka in Japan under American command. So look, it, it's been a, an, a long-term process that's continuing today. I don't think, quite frankly, Australia has grown up. I don't think we yet have reached a stage where we take a hard, vigorous look at the way in which our armed forces increasingly are integrated, both in training and in, in live fire exercise and all the rest of it, with the United States. But it was the same, it's been the same ever since uh, we, we threw our lot in with the United States after Pearl Harbor, after Singapore, the, the attack on Singapore, the defeat of Singapore. Britain couldn't help us anymore. And they were very disingenuous in suggesting that the Prince of Wales and the Repulse and their surrounding flotilla, if they were sent to the buttress, the, the, the bulwark of Singapore, would protect Australia from Japan. They couldn't. They were sunk in the first couple of days of being there by the Japanese. Ever since we relied on the United States. It's about time, I think, that this country had a much more independent defence policy without, and we could do this without compromising our very real relationship with the United States. A good friend is someone who can advise vigorously from an independent point of view a powerful neighbour. And we could particularly do that with our foreign policy as assets in, in this region with the United States over how they should conduct themselves in this region. I don't think we do nearly enough of it. I do hope that the Albanese government, in general and Penny Wong in particular, is going to take a much more hard-headed look at uh, the formulation and conduct of Australian foreign policy. Uh, yeah, we've got two two more from Chris Skinner. Uh, I might put them both to you at the same time. Sure. Uh, the first one is uh, well. The first one begins with a comment. Uh, Australia already has a nuclear-approved base uh, in HMAS uh, Stirling, south of Fremantle, and approval for several ports, including Brisbane, for visits by nuclear-powered warships. Does that change your viewpoint? Uh, and the second uh, reads: Australia is a maritime power that depends utterly on maritime trade that we need to protect. Do you agree? On the second question, of course, we have to agree on that. Uh, but um, when you ask the question, who is our greatest enemy? The military are very shy in saying that it's China, but if you push them hard enough, they'll say, oh, yes, it's China. All right, who's our greatest trading partner? Oh, yes, it's China. So why do we cast our greatest trading partner as our greatest enemy. What a contradiction. Sorry, I'm lost for track here. What was the first question that Chris, Chris asked, please? Oh, about Sterling? Yes, all right, Chris. Look, I, I'm, I'm not up with all the details on how many nuclear propelled and nuclear armed ships of the United States Navy have visited Australia, but I bet it's quite a lot. We didn't take the New Zealand vigorous option of saying you can't come in if you don't declare your nuclear power and weapons, because the Americans say it is not our policy to say what is on our ships. So the Kiwis said, well, bugger off then, we don't want you here. Uh, Sterling, yes, it's our, in my view, it's a very misplaced base. It should be right up in the Northern Territory. It takes days of steaming to get a submarine or any surface combat ship from Sterling up to the operational area where it's most needed. Why don't we have a base up north? But also, no, it has not yet been decided, I think, Chris, if I, with all respect, on which eastern uh, coast port will become a base for Australian nuclear-propelled submarine. And that, that fight has not yet even begun. I mean, can you imagine any Australian politician worth his or her salt is not going to suggest having a nuclear reactor in their electorate? That's a kiss of death. This nuclear allergy we have continues. It's alive and well. And it's going to have a lot to do in shaping the way the Australian government goes about 
uh, constructing a base in Brisbane or in Sydney, good heavens, Sydney, a nuclear base in Sydney, or down on the south coast in Wollongong. I think that was the third possibility. There's a lot, a lot to be worked out. And when I see Mr Dutton talking so certainly about the, 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 the virtue of having nuclear propelled submarines, his logic escapes me, quite frankly. And when he says it's inevitable that we will have a war with China, that's a stupid, silly thing to say. It's almost as bad as Donald Trump walking away from the JCPOA with Iran. Um, is it by any chance Chris Skinner? Okay. <laughs> next, next question. Hey, uh, our next question uh, comes from Sion T. Uh, on matters of sovereignty and reliance on the US, do you see US domestic instability as a risk to Australia's plan to increase reliance on the US further when it comes to submarines? Politicians, particularly on the conservative side of politics in Australia, are fond of saying we share everything in common with the United States. But that's no longer the case. With the Supreme Court stacked the way it is in the United States against abortion, when we see the rise of the Christian right wing in the United States, which is bordering on fascism, when we see the lack of gun control in the United States and the horrific mass murders that take place in schools across that great country, do we want this stuff in Australia? Do we have it? We do not. Some of, us, some of our uh, less um, optimistic observers would say we're heading in that direction, but thank God we're not nearly there yet. So I suggest that, uh, no, it's not. We, we, we still have much in common, of course, our language, our history, our culture, uh, American movies, not Australian rules football, unfortunately. But all these things are happening and, and they're still there. They, they will remain there and we can still remain close friends with the United States, providing we have a greater, healthier respect for our own sovereignty and independence of, of thinking, especially in foreign policy and defence. There was, can I be heard? There was a puzzling incident, uh, I guess a month or so ago now, puzzling incident where an Australian Air Force uh, plane was attacked with chaff, with, with metal fragments by a Chinese aircraft. Am I right in forming the impression that that Australian aircraft was flying as part of joint operations with the United States Air Force from, from Clark Base and, as some have suggested, identifying targets with China? That's a very good question, Ian. Look, we don't know. The, the, the press are too lazy to do the necessary research to tell us. Yes, it came out of Clark. It's a modified Boeing 737, which is now uh, armed with depth charges and, and is a military aircraft for spotting submarines particularly. But it also is a plane that is capable of dropping mines or uh, communications buoys into the, into the sea. Now, we don't know whether it was in international waters when it was attacked by the J-16 Chinese aircraft. We don't know why the Chinese aircraft went in front of it and, and distributed chaff, some of which got in the engines, but it d didn't stop it flying. But there's a whole lot of un un unanswered questions here. And it seems to me that there's an ambiguity. What was the Australian plane doing? On whose command, on whose behalf? Uh, was it dropping sonar boys? Uh, to, 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 um, to track Chinese underwater vessels. Is it correct that the Chinese said, look, it's in our territorial waters, it's in, in, in encroaching on, on the islands? We don't know any of this. I would have thought it would be an intelligent thing for the Defence Department or the RAF to tell us exactly what it was, except probably it was involved in some sort of surveillance and observation and therefore they're not going to tell us. John asks, is there any parliamentary question? John, I don't think Parliament is sitting yet. We have to wait to see. There could be some questions. Be very good if there is. You, you should draft one and send it to your local okay, member. Thanks. Okay. 
I'd send it to mine except Allegra Spender with her wonderful heritage being the granddaughter of Sir Percy who signed the ANZUS Treaty. I don't think Allegra is yet up to speed on questions like that, but maybe she could be. I might talk to her. Okay, well, we are not yet at the end of our time, but we don't have to uh, keep He's going. got some We've more. Got some more. Is it Christina again? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, our next question is from David Kiernan. Uh, if we don't need nuclear submarines, would air-launched ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads be a sufficient deterrent or mobile land-based launches? Sorry, if we don't have the submarines, do we need land-based launches? Is that the question? Uh, it asks, would air base, would, sorry, would air-launched ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads be a sufficient deterrent or alternatively mobile well, land-based launches? That's a huge question, whether we need a nuclear deterrent at all. In my view, we don't, because, John, sh shush, please. We, we don't, if we want to provide proliferation we should get nuclear weapons. Look at the situation in the Middle East. Iran, which the Israelis suspect is developing surreptitiously nuclear weapons, and I doubt that at this stage. If Iran went nuclear, Saudi Arabia would be given nuclear weapons from Pakistan. Iran is surrounded by six nuclear powers. Count them, including Israel. They're hovering on the brink of nuclear proliferation in that region. Would Egypt or Turkey be far behind? In our own region, the Koreans I know, I was ambassador there, it happened during that time, we found out that they did have hot cell um, equipment, which is part of the process of, 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 of handling uh, highly enriched, highly irradiated fuel for nuclear weapons. It was stopped by the United States. Taiwan, which has four to six nuclear reactors, has also been prohibited or stopped by the United States from going ahead. I would have thought some time ago, after North Korea detonated its first nuclear weapon in 2006, and they've had five since then, including the last one as a hydrogen bomb, thermonuclear weapon, that the Japanese by this stage and the, Korean, the South Koreans would both be on the path towards nuclear power, nuclear weapons, but they haven't yet. It's a, but it's a very, very line ball situation, a very tense situation. And uh, we just have to hope that calm heads prevail in those countries. But if Australia developed nuclear weapons, There'd be a lot of, Indonesia would probably be the next country to do it. Possibly Malaysia, probably Singapore, Vietnam. Penny Wong has just been in Vietnam and had a good talk with the foreign minister. And it's good to see because uh, the Vietnamese are very indignant about what they regard as trespassing on their Paracel Islands by China in, in recent days. Uh, but they have a very cool, very sophisticated approach towards the Chinese. And since the Korean War, the only uh, dispute, the only military exercise, the only military engagement the Chinese have taken part in is when they tried to teach Vietnam a lesson for invading Cambodia in the early days of 1979. And um, they were given a bloody nose because the Vietnamese were ready for it. But the Vietnamese don't want a war with China which they couldn't win in the long run, it's like Ukraine and, the, and, and Russia. But they're, they're very sophisticated and they know how to handle the Chinese. And I think Australia could draw lessons from the Vietnamese on that. And I think Ian would agree. Yes, it's a very good point. I, I, I very much like your underlying point that getting into the situation of assuming that China's our enemy is asking for trouble. Now, we don't have to finish up if there's a further urge for questions. <laughs> One last question from the internet. Sorry. Um, so our, I, I suppose what is our last question now? Uh, it's going to be this. Um, regarding the uh, products, the, the mindset you mentioned about US products, uh, 
do you think what to what extent do you think that's a product of a, the mindset of Australian decision makers as opposed to the template that the US has been applying to military product development with other partners? Would you say that in many other countries uh, that are partnered with U the US in military product development and promotion strategies, there would be a similar position as in Australia right now? Uh, and could you comment if they're about whether if that is so, if they're holding similar concerns about the US's approach to setting up and managing these partnerships? I, I take it that the questioner means by American products, American defence platforms and equipment. And does Australia have a preference for those? Is that really what uh, The question is, if, if, if there's a, a mindset that America still has some, uh, oh, the questioner says no, uh, we, might, we might see if we, we get any more detail on that. Um, I can move on. I've got other questions, so we want to move on to... Please do. That, we, that one is a bit ambiguous. I'm not sure what he means. We might, we might get some clarification on that. And sure. I'll, I'll see if something else comes through. Um, in that case, we might take this one instead. Uh, if we went with nuclear submarines and we aren't refining our own enriched fuel, we'd be exporting uh, and presumably giving it away, as it appears we do with petroleum products, and then buying it back with usually inflated prices from our partners. Uh, and no doubt uh, having to store and spend, uh, store spent fuel here as part of the contractual deal. True. Um, we don't have the technology to enrich and fabricate fuel rods to go in a pressurised water reactor of the kind that the Americans use in their, naval, in their submarines. Uh, we might develop it and we have a, a nuclear uh, chap, very honoured to have someone from Ansto with us tonight. Um, Mark Ho, and welcome to him here. But I, I, I think as a layman, someone who knows as a layman something about nuclear power, I don't think we have these capacities and therefore we'd have to... Look, what, this is what the Brits do. They buy uranium, unrefined uranium, from a whole lot of countries in Africa, including Chad, and from Australia, and they have it brought to... to, to to you, to the United Kingdom, where they turn it into uranium hexafluoride, and, and they can enrich it. But I think some of the process is also done in the United States, in which they're hand in glove because they've got the same pressurised water technology in their submarines as do the Americans. In fact, it came from the United States. We'd, we'd be the same, and the, the the chain of of processes required for to get the. Uh, fuel rods to put into our reactors would be, would be uh, very complicated and we wouldn't have control over the whole process at all. Thank you very much, Richard. A very generous response to some curly questions. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Our next event will be two weeks hence on Tuesday the 12th of July the launch of a book by Dr. Alex Korolov, who's spoken to us here at the Institute before, and his new book explores the new st strategic relationship between Russia and China. Do recommend that you come along and join us for that one. But to finish off this evening, one of our interns, Drew Beacom, will move a vote of thanks. On behalf of the Australian Institute of International Affairs in New South Wales, I'd like to move a vote of thanks to Richard for his presentation tonight on his new, oh, the relaunch of the Fact or Fission. It was really intriguing listening to not only the debate, but also your take on where AUKUS uh, leaves Australia going forward with uh, nuclear proliferation. I can count on the fact that I think this debate will have many times into the future. So would you all join me in uh, a round of applause for Richard? Thank you.